Hello and welcome to Morning the Narrative. I am McBulo. The show will feature the top news of the week, complete with my observations, and even a little bit of snapcasm thrown in. The top news stories will be taken from my morning news briefings that I write on the, on the Rick Bulo new media blog every weekday morning. If you go on to like what you see, smash that thumbs up button. And now, let's go right into the news. The Olympics is set to start in about a month from now, and there's already some controversy amongst the Olympic trials. Now, there have been controversies in the past, you know, with two, two black Americans holding up their fist during the 1968 Olympics, and of course you had have the the whole Russia was so Soviet Union United States controversy in in 1972 with a basketball gold medal. This one is during the the Olympic trials, and found this from the Associated Press. So let's get right to there. Says message sent, baby turns away from flag during anthem. For the past week, they played the national anthem one time and night at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials. On Saturday, well, the song just happened to stay while I was spoken to activist Gwen Berry was standing at the podium after receiving her bronze medal in the hammer throw. While the music played, Berry placed her left hand on her hip and shuffled her feet. She took a quarter turn so she was facing the stands, not the flag. Toward the end, she plucked up her black t-shirt with the words activist athlete and blazing on the front and draped it over her head. I feel like it was a setup and they did it on purpose, Barry said of the timing of the anthem. I was PO'd, to be honest. Barry's reaction to the Star Spangled Banner took its fair share of the spotlight on a blazing hot second to last day of trials that featured some blazing fast times. Gabby Thomas became the second fastest woman ever in the 200, winning the final in 21.61 seconds. The only w- w- woman faster, Florence Griffith Joyner. And as expected, Grant Holloway won the 110 meter hurdles, though his time in the semifinals was the eye opener. His 12.81 was only one one hundredth of a second off the world mark. Other winners said it included Emily Sisson in the 10,000. Katie Nagyota in the pole vault, Maggie Malone in the javelin, by Benjamin in the 400 hurdles, and, and Brittany Reese in the long jump. Not winning, Allison Felix, who finished fifth in the 200, but had already secured her spot in the 400. Also, Noah Lyles finished second in this 200 semifinal and looked somewhat shocked to see that 17-year-old Arian Knighton had beaten him, had beaten him to the line. Knighton finished in 1988 at top in under 20 world record that he had been held, or that had been held by none other than Usain Bolt. Earlier, with temperatures reaching 101 degrees on the field, Mary earned her spot on her platform at the Tokyo Olympics, grabbing the third spot by a scan two inches over Janie Kessenavoid. Mary has promised to use her position to keep raising awareness about social injustices in her home country. My purpose and my mission is bigger than sports, Barry said. I'm here to represent those who died due to systemic racism. That's the important part. That's why I'm going. That's why I'm here today. She found it, she found it to be no matter of importance that she was put in center during the anthem. Unlike the Olympics, they don't play anthems to accompany medal ceremonies at the trials. But the hammer throwers received their rewards just before the start of the evening session which has been kicking off all week to a video rendition of the Star Spangled Banner played on the scoreboard. USA Track and Field spokeswoman Susan Hazard said, the national anthem was scheduled to play at 5.20 p.m. today. We didn't wait until the athletes were on the podium for the Hammer Throw Awards. The national anthem is played every day according to a previously published schedule. On Saturday, the music started at 5.25. And so, while winner Deanna Price and second place finisher Brooke Anderson stood tall on the, pl- on the podium with their hands over their hearts and stared straight ahead at the American and Oregon flags, Barry fidgeted and paced on the third step. 
then turned away and finally grabbed her T-shirt. They said they were going to play it before we, we walked out, when, then they played it when we were out there, Barry said. But I don't know and really want to talk about the anthem because that's not important. The anthem doesn't speak for me, it never has. Barry's gestures grew, root, no, grew virtually no reaction from the still-filling stands, and there was something far less than two summers ago when she raised her fist on the podium after winning the Pan Am Games. That demonstration led to a sanction, but ultimately pushed the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee to commit to not punishing athletes who raise fists or kneel at the trials or in Tokyo. It's a potential flashpoint for Tokyo, where the IOC has said that it will enforce its Rule 50 that bans demonstrations inside the lines. It's the same prohibition that got spinners Tommy Smith and John Carlos sent home from the Mexico City Games in 1968. And now, baby, we'll be heading to a second Olympics, and she saw what, will, what it will take to win anything close to a similar moment in Tokyo. Price won with a throw of 263 feet 6 inches or 80.31 meters, which was nearly 7 feet longer than Barry's throw. Price, who became only the second woman in history to crack 80 meters, had no problem sharing the stage with Barry. I think people should say whatever they want to say. I'm proud of her, Price said. She figures to be going for gold along with world record holder Anita Wodacek of Poland, who was ex expected to be in Japan. Meanwhile, Anderson Stroh was a mere two inches shy of Perry's personal best. Barry said she needed to get my mind right, my body right, and my spirit right for the Olympics. The women's hammer throw starts August 1st. But she doesn't think she needs to be on the platform in Tokyo to have an impact. I don't do anything. I don't need to do, to do anything sport-wise, she said. What I need to do is speak for my community, to represent my community, and to help my community, because that's more important than sports. Now, I do agree with her on that part. However, however, my opinion, the Olympics is putting national pride on the line and you know i mean there's a lot of controversy going on in sports surrounding the stars surrounding the national anthem star spangled banner i mean you had colin kaepernick setting it up with kneeling uh during the star spangled banner then you had many people not participating you know, opting to hang back in their dressing rooms at times for all sports. And you have had a few kneelers and basically some who just don't, just don't do anything. But, you know, if you play, okay, to me, if you play a sport, don't bring politics into it. I mean, that is the worst possible place for politics to take place is in sports. I mean, people want to, okay, people, people watch sports, they watch movies to get away from the political atmosphere. That's just not the case to do it in. And, oh, by the way, there... There are, there are a few more articles on it. This from CNN. Gwen Berry stand, or turns away from flag at U.S. Olympic trials podium says she was set up. Hammersville Gwen Berry says that the playing of the South Spangle or of the National Anthem while she was at the podium at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials was set up. Berry turned away from the flag to face the stands while the South Spangle banner played during the medal ceremony on Saturday. She then draped a t-shirt bearing the words activist athlete over her head, having placed third in the hammer event at the trials in Eugene, Oregon. Barry, gained, Barry earned a spot on the team for the Tokyo Olympics, which got her, which get underway next month. I feel like it was set up. I feel that they, like they did that on purpose. Now it's P.O. to be honest, said Barry, of the anthem being played while she was on the podium. I was thinking about what I, sh about what should I do eventually. I just stayed there and just swayed. I put my shit over my head. It was real disrespectful. I know they did that on purpose, but it'll be all right. I see what's up. USA Track and Field did not respond to CNN's request for comment, but according to Reuters, it said that the anthem was played each day at the trials according to a prearranged schedule. We didn't win until the athletes won the podium for the Hammersworth Awards, said USATF spokeswoman 
Susan Hazard, were thrilled with the with women's hammer throw team that selected, that selected themselves for the games. By the way, the anthem has only, has been played one each evening throughout the trials. They said that they were going to play it before we, we walked out, and they played it when we were out there. So Barry, according to ESPN, but I don't but I don't really want to talk about the anthem because that's not important. The anthem doesn't speak for me; it never has. On Instagram, Barry added a caption alongside photos of her on the podium, saying, "I." Said what I, I said what I said, I meant what I said. Stop playing with me, period. Then on Twitter, Barry said how comments on social media shows that even after the murder of George Floyd and so, and so many others, the commercial statements and, and friendly sentiments regarding black lives were just a hoax. In 2019, Barry lost some of his sponsorships after raising her fist in protest on the podium. At the Pan American Games in Peru, she received a 12-month probation from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee for the for the act, which she says was meant to highlight social injustice in America. For me, it was extremely devastating because they cut off all, all, all my revenue. The 31-year-old Barry told CNN of the situation last year: competing, going overseas, going to competitions, getting prize money, and then ultimately making the Olympic team helped me, help my family, help my community. In an open letter to athletes earlier this year, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee CEO Susan Hirschland outlined how respectful demonstrations on the topic of racial and social justice would be allowed at the Olympic and Paralympic trials. Now, while we support your right to demonstrate peacefully in, the, in support of racial and social justice, we cannot control the actions others may take in, in response, the letter said. However, a ban on protests and demonstrations at the Tokyo Olympics will be in place after the International Olympic Committee upheld Rule 50, which states that no kind of demonstration or political, religious, or racial propaganda permitted in any Olympic sites, venues, or other areas. And I, and I mean, it'll be interesting to see just, just what happens during the Olympics at this. You know, I mean it. To me, it's to me it just spells about right disrespect and shame. But you know, other people have their opinions, and I honor that. As a matter of fact, there's this from the Huffington Post. Excuse me. Black activist athlete Gwen Berry turns back on flag during anthem at Olympic trials. And outspoken black act activist athlete Gwen Berry turned her back on the American flag as the national anthem played at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials this weekend. Berry and Hammersborough also put her t-shirt over her head to protest racism. After she was awarded a bronze medal Saturday at the trials in Eugene, Oregon, the student with the shirt read activist athlete. Now unlike at the Olympics where the, where the anthem of an athlete's nation is played when medals are awarded, the anthem at the trials is played only one seat evening. Mary told reporters that it seemed like a setup that the anthem was played just as she was on the podium, given her well-known views against racism in the country. I feel like it was a setup and they did it on purpose. Mary said at the timing, according to the Associated Press, and just as I had mentioned in, in the article, or in, in the AP article that I had read earlier, Barry emphasized to reporters that her purpose and mission is bigger than sports. I'm here to represent those who die due to systemic racism. What I need to do is speak for my country to represent my country and help my community. What I, what I need to do is speak for my community to represent for my community and to help my community because that's more important than sports, she, she added. A USA track and field spokesperson told CNN that the anthem plays at a set time each day and we didn't wait for the athletes to be on the podium. Barry tweeted out, stop playing with me. The other two hammer throw winners, first place winner Deanna Price and runner Buck Anderson, remained on the podium facing the flag with, their, with hands over their hearts. An overwhelming number of people responding to Barry's tweets about the incident were positive. Predictably, Fox News and, and right-wing former Wisconsin GOP Governor Scott Walker complained against it. What's wrong with these people, Walker asked. 
former chief of the police, former chief of the Office of Government Ethics, Walter Shaw, pointed out to Walker that what's un, that, that what's actually unpatriotic is lying about presidential elections and inciting insurrections. Walker tweeted out, "What's wrong with people growing up? Everyone stood for the American flag. Didn't matter your politics, race, sex, income, religion. Everyone stood for the flag." It was one of those civic rituals that brought us together, as so should today. To which Walter Schaub replied with some patriotic, is lying about not losing elections and inciting insurrections at the Capitol building. Voter suppression is unpatriotic too, so is rejecting anti-corruption legislation. Then of thieves tweeted out, it's called living in a democracy, not a nation wrapped in a flag, carrying a Bible. Eric Calverson said, is, tweeted out, is this your preferred ritual? And there's a picture. Barry personally responded to Fox News on Twitter with a big F U. Barry and American friends of Ray Simboden were, give, were each given a 12 month probation in 2019 by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee for protesting against social injustice at the U, in the U.S. at the Pan American Games in Lima, Peru that year. Barry raised her fist during the medical, during the medal ceremony after winning there, the U.S. OPC. Last year, publicly and, publicly and privately apologized to Barry and officials changed the rule to allow protests at domestic events. Donald Trump has slammed American athletes who take a knee during the anthem to protest racial injustice. He won't be able to attack Barry from a White House platform now. In other Olympic trial news, Gabby Thomas became the second fastest woman ever at the 200 meter race, winning the final in 21.61 seconds. Grant Holloway won the 110 meter hurdles. His 12.81 time in the semifinals was only one one hundredth of, of a second off the world off the world world record. And then and then of course there's this from my good friends over at twitchy.com who basically just had a field day with Gwen Berry. Olympian Gwen, Gwen Berry she says she's Piotr and it was disrespectful to play the national anthem while she was on the on the medal stand. Hammers throw with Gwen Berry after qualifying for the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, turned away from the US flag to protest the playing of the national anthem while she was on the medal stand. AP Sports tweeted out Hammers throw with Gwen, Gwen Berry turned away from the flag during the national anthem on the podium at the US Olympic trials. She then draped her black T-shirt with the words activist athlete and blazing on the front over her head. Now the anthem, which was, which at this qualifying event was only played once during each day of the competition, just happened to occur when she was setting, or while she was getting her bronze medal. This, she said, was a setup. Sports Center tweeted out as the national anthem played while Gwen Berry was on the podium after qualifying for the Olympics. She turned away from the flag and draped her shirt with the words activist athlete over her head. She felt the timing of the anthem was a setup. Stop playing with me, she later tweeted. Barry also held up a t-shirt with activist athlete on the front during the ceremony. The athletic tweeted out hammer thrower Gwen Barry tweeted or turned away from the American flag during the playing of the US national anthem at the US Olympic trials. Barry, a vocal activist, said she felt like the timing of the anthem Saturday was a setup. She's never been a fan for the song. Gary Young tweeted out, the anthem doesn't speak for me, it never has. Gotta love Admiral's Barry Throws. And my Anne Hamish Neal tweeted out, my purpose and my mission is bigger than sports. I'm here to represent those who died due to systemic racism. That's the important part. That's why I'm going. That's why I'm here today. Said in a tweet from Gwen Barry. Barry told reporters after the event that she was PO, that they played it red when she was getting her medal. The New York Post tweeting out, him, Olympic Hammers Warwick Gwen Berry P.O. National Anthem was playing. It was disrespectful. I know they did it then on purpose, she told Joe Knows. Washington Post Sports tweeted out, I feel like it was a setup, Barry said with a burst of laughter. It was real disrespectful. I know they did it, that they did it on purpose, but it'll be all right. I see what's up. And her evidence for this conspiracy theory? The anthem has been scheduled to play at around 5.20 p.m. every evening in trials. On Saturday, the music started at 5.25 p.m. while the hammer throws were on the podium. 
Gwen Baby tweeted out, the anthem has been scheduled to play at around 5.20 every evening at trials. On Saturday, the music started at 5.25 while the hammer throwers were on the podium. Like I said, set up. Five minutes is longer than you think. Oh, blank, blank, as it wasn't a setup. When Barry tweeted out, don't set me up and think I won't jump. In reply to Nick, to Nick Zakari saying, Gwen Barry during the award ceremony for the Hammer Throw at Olympic Trials where she competed, where, where she qualified for the Tokyo Games. And there's the, there's the, the picture there. And there's more on this. I'll, I'll, I'll get into more about this tomorrow, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just a shame that everything is, is becoming so politicized, but like I said, I'll get more, I'll get into this more in, in the next video. Leave a comment down below what, what you think about all this, you know, do you, do you agree with Gwen, baby? Do you disagree with her? You know, what do you think, she, what, what do you think should happen to her? Leave a comment down below. I'll have the articles that I've read packed in the show notes below. And I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday I spoke on Gwen Berry and, and what she did at the Olympic trials in Eugene when she turned her back on the American flag. There has been a little bit of more more on this, this coming from thehill.com, which, which says, Gwen Berry battles Dan Crenshaw over flag fight. Y'all are obsessed with me. U.S. Olympic hammer thrower Gwen, Gwen Berry spread with Representative Dan, Dan Crenshaw of the Republican of Texas after he criticized her for turning away from the American flag. During the, US, during the National Anthem at the U.S. Check and Field Trials. We retweeted, at this point, y'all are, obs are obsessed with, with me in response to Crenshaw responding to a video from the lawmaker's appearance on Fox News. You can see the tweet there. We returned away from the American flag and toward the stands when the National Anthem began playing on Saturday and placed a t-shirt with the words activist athlete over her head. She said it felt like it was a setup and they did it on purpose because she had, was previously told the anthem would, would, would be played before the athletes walked out, according to ESPN. A USA track and field spokeswoman, spokeswoman however, said the timing was already scheduled for 5.20 p.m. local time in Eugene, Oregon. Mary previously said that she would use her position at the Tokyo Olympics to keep awareness focused on social injustice in the U.S. The move sparked criticism among Republicans, including Crenshaw, who called for Barry to be removed from the U.S. Olympic team and said, we don't need any more activist athletes. We don't need any more activist athletes. She should be removed from the team, Crenshaw said during an interview on Fox and & Friends. There's, and there's the tweet there. He then likened Barry's actions at the field trials to NBA players demonstrating near the national anthem before games. The entire point of the Olympic system, or the Olympic team is to represent the United States of America. That's the entire point. Okay, so, you know, it's one thing when these NBA players are okay, fine, we'll just stop watching. But now the Olympic team and it's multiple places of this, Crenshaw said. They should be removed. That should be the, the bare minimum requirement is that you believe in the country representing, he, he added. Barry tweeted back at Crenshaw and the other backlash she, rele she received. Writing on Twitter, at this point, y'all are obsessed with me. She also took, she also directly took on Crenshaw, retweeting a tweet that said, Dan can kiss my butt. This is from Ms. Mox, hot black bitter, Dan can kiss my butt. And if folks going to be mad at black American athletes, uh, when y'all going to cheer for the USA? Because we're everywhere in these Olympics. Ms. Barry throws is that deal, and, and y'all... She put some respect on her name, period. Barry first raised a fist when she was on the podium during a, the Pan American Games in Peru, according to the Washington Post. She was placed on probation by the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, but the group later apologized to Barry. In March, the committee said it would allow some forms of demonstrations during the qualifying trials, including kneeling during the anthem and raising fists. 
Athletes will also be allowed to peacefully and respectfully engage in demonstrations in support of racial or social causes at the Games. And there is this from Fox News uh, on that. When Barry Flag snubbing U.S. check and field star defended, defended by the White House. So yes, even President Biden's involved in this. Saki says, Biden believes pride in our country means recognizing that we haven't lived up to our highest ideals. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki Monday defended U.S. track and field star Gwen Berry's decision to turn her back on the, Amer uh, on the nation's flag, saying Berry was seeking to peacefully protest the moments that Americans haven't lived up to our highest ideals. Berry, 31, placed third over the weekend in the hammer throw during the U.S. Olympic trials, earning her a spot on the team. As the national anthem was played, she turned from the flag. This weekend, Gwen Berry, who hopes to represent the United States as an Olympian on the Hammers Rowing events, won a bronze medal at the trials, and then she turned her back on the flag while the anthem played. Fox News' Peter Ducey said to Saki during the Daily Press, or during the Daily White House briefing, Does President Biden think that is appropriate behavior for someone who hopes to represent Team USA? Well, Peter, I, I haven't spoken to the President specifically about this. But I know he's incredibly proud to be an American and has great respect for the anthem and all that it represents, especially for our men and women serving in uniform all over the world, Saki said. He would also say, of course, that, pride in, that part of that pride in our country means recognizing that there are moments where we are, as a country, haven't lived, lived up to our highest ideals, and it means respecting the right of people, granting them in the Constitution to peacefully protest. Barry has a history of taking controversial stances, raising a fist during the medal ceremony at the Pan American Games in 2019. The anthem doesn't speak for me, it never has, said Barry. My purpose and my mission is bigger than sports, Barry said. Now, it remains to be seen, at least uh, uh, on my end, just what she means by that statement, but it's definitely worth keeping eyes on and found out that she's from the Southern Illinois area, or, or yeah, Southern Illinois area. As a matter of fact, I think she, I think, uh, I think somebody said she went to Southern Illinois University, so there might be many people upset in her neck of the woods on that. But there are many people who say that she should be removed from the team. As a matter of fact, there's this article from Russia Today that says, Don't send her to the Olympics. Fury after U.S. Samus Rower turns back on flag as anthem plays during medal ceremony. This from Sunday. Hammers Brower Gwen Berry claims she was a victim of a setup after turning away from the Stars and Stripes as the national anthem played while she collected her bronze medal at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials. Berry booked a spot at this year's Tokyo Olympics by finishing third behind Deanna Price and Brooke Anderson on Saturday in Eugene, Oregon, sending the 31-year-old to her second successive games, but that achievement was overshadowed by what happened on the podium after the competition. As the three athletes were collecting their medals, a Star Spangled Banner struck up, prompting Barry to turn away from the U.S. flag and eventually cover her head with a black t-shirt and blaze in with the words, Activist Athlete on the front. Pete from Nick Zaccardi says Gwen Barry during the awards ceremony for the Hammers at the Olympic Trials Hope where she qualified for the Tokyo Games via, excuse me, via the AP. Now, the U.S. anthem is is played once every evening at the trials as opposed to during each medal ceremony. And Barry, who is a vocal social activist, claimed there was no coincidence that it had started while she was on the podium. I feel it was a setup and they did it on purpose, Barry said. I was PAO'd, to be honest. However, organizers denied any purposeful timing, asserting that the anthem was played at a pre scheduled time. The national anthem was scheduled to play at 5.20 p.m. today, said USA Track and Field spokeswoman Susan Hazard. We did not wait until the athletes won the podium for the Hammers Awards. The national anthem is played every day according to a previously published schedule. According to ESPN, the music had started at 5.25 p.m. on Saturday and Barry remained convinced 
that she was being deliberately triggered. They said they were going to play it before we, we walked out, and they played it when we were out there, said the Hammer's Diary. But I really, but I, but I don't, don't really want to talk about the anthem because that's not important. The anthem doesn't speak for me, it never does. Social justice warrior Barry has come under scrutiny for her podium actions in the past, raising a fist during the presentation ceremony after winning the Pan Am Games back in 2019. Now, she was sanctioned for the gesture, but the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee was later pushed to promise that it wouldn't punish at least for any peaceful protests in Tokyo this summer. Despite the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, take, saying actions such as taking an knee will, will be banned. Barry's latest, act of, were, Barry's latest display of defiance through a mixed reaction online with some hailing her as a legend. Good on her, wish more people would understand that an anthem is symbolic, just like the flag. There are no requirements for you to participate in the reverence, wrote one fan on social media. But there was also a considerable backlash and calls for Barry not to be sent to represent her nation this summer if she has such obvious issues with honoring its symbol. April Marie tweeted out, what the crap is this? You don't have respect for our, for our anthem man or flag? Fine, but you really shouldn't, fine, but you shouldn't represent our nation. If she doesn't want to represent us, don't send her with another blunt assessment. Sharing the story and the image of Barry turning her back, right wing and commenter Dinesh D'Souza vote. We're going to see more of this. It's going to make patriotic, patriotic Americans cheer for, for foreign competitors and against the anti-American Americans. Angry observers should brace for similar scenes at this summer's games in Japan, considering the increasing proclivity for athletes to display their social virtues as, as well as sporting prowess. That includes Barry, who proclaimed that her mission is bigger than sports. I'm here to represent those who died due to systemic racism. That's the important part. That's why I'm going. That's why I'm here today, said the hammer thrower. And you can see a picture of her raising her fist during the Pan Am games, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's just an interesting, and as Brandon Moore said over at Red State, and it, uh, it's a VIP, but, but there, there is another there, the thing about that, but yeah, I mean, you know, you know, so thing, things are rather tough. It remains to be seen just what will happen, but I'll have more comments on it. In the, in, in the comment section below, leave your thoughts as to what you think about all this. You know, do you agree with her? Do you disagree with her? You know, do you, do you think that she should not be a part of the, of the Olympic team? Leave a comment down below. I'll have the articles that I've read today listed in the show notes. And I'll see you in the next video. Tucker Carlson has been a journalist for about 20 years or so. He was part of Crossfire over on CNN with Paul Begala. Rush Limbaugh called him Chadsworth Osborne Jr. because of the way that Tucker had worn a lot of bow ties. He moved to Fox News in twenty in the late twenty teens and is a host of Tucker Carlson Tonight, which comes on right before Sean Hannity. And he's gotten himself into a little bit of a controversial turmoil. This coming from Spectator.org, the American Spectator. Tucker Carlson says the NSA is spying on him. The leading conservative commentator may be in the crosshairs of the surveillance state. Conservative commentator Tucker Carlson, host of Fox News' Tucker Carlson Tonight, made a stunning accusation on, on Monday evening. The Biden administration is spying on us. Carlson told his audience of more than 3 million viewers that he had been contacted by a whistleblower within the U.S. government who warned that the National Security Agency, or NSA, was monitoring the electronic communications between him and his staff. Carlson said he believes that the leading surveillance agency is planning to leak this information in an attempt to take the show off the air, but he did not provide evidence to back up his claim. 
Callison then vouched for the legitimacy of his source, claiming that the whistleblower was able to repeat back information about our upcoming Tucker Carlson Tonight story that could have only come directly from my texts and emails. There is no other possible source for that information, period. If Carlson's allegation is true, it would constitute the, one of the most damning revelations about the U.S. surveillance state and the Biden administration's usage to it or of it to date. One of spying on Americans is plainly illegal, though the NSA appears to have made little effort to change its approach this, despite years of political and media scrutiny since the 2013 Snowden leaks. Furthermore, as Tucker Carlson pointed out during his Monday evening segment, there would be additional ethical concerns about a ruling government spying on an opposition journalist and attempting to deplatform them. Now, there is little doubt that Carlson has made himself deeply unpopular in the U.S. intelligence circuit. He has been one of the main journalistic voices on either side of the political spectrum, pushing back against what he has described as abuses of power by the deep state. Most recently, he suggested that the FBI may have played a role in fomenting the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Breaking with much of the riot, Carlson has also picked fights with the rest of the permanent Washington apparatus, in particular the leadership of the Pentagon. On Thursday last week, he caused consternation among liberal commentators for call after calling General Merrick Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Chiefs of Staff, a pig and stupid for endorsing critical race theory, reading materials in the military. Carlson closed his Monday segment by stating that his team has filed a Freedom of Information Act request for what the NSA has gathered about his show. America's being surveillance state organ is, of course, unlikely to hand over anything useful. And indeed, Carlson noted that, that the request was filed mostly as a formality. He continued, only Congress can force transparency on the intelligence agencies, and they should do that immediately. Indeed, but let us not forget that the same kind of people who run the NSA are now in control of Congress. And that is so very true. There is also this from the Huffington Post by Ron Dicker. Tucker Carlson claims NSA is spying on him to cancel his Fox News show. Tucker, Tucker Carlson alleged Monday that the National Security Agency is spying on him to get his primetime Fox News show canceled. There's a clip below. Yesterday we heard from a whistleblower within the U.S. government who, who reached out to warn us that the NSA is monitoring our electronic communications and is planning to leak them in an attempt to take the show off the air, he said. Carlson, a Fox News star who has pushed revisionist takes on the Capitol insurrection, stoked fears over teaching students about racism and advanced anti vaccine conspiracy theories, said he had proof of government spying from his source who knew about a story that the show was working on that could only have come from Carlson's texts and emails. The Biden administration is spying on us, Carlson declared. We have confirmed that. Spying on opposition journalists is incompatible with democracy, he added. This is scary and we need to stop it right away. Bradley P. Moss, a lawyer specializing in national security, expressed skepticism about Carlson's pronouncement, but allowed that maybe his comms were picked up. Tucker is making serious accusations with no proof and is basing co corroboration on a story he allegedly is working on that none of us know about. Maybe his comms were picked up. We know DOJ collected comms of journals during Trump and Ob Obama presidencies. That in a tweet from Brad Moss yesterday, famed whistleblower Edward Snowden revealed that the NSA's mass surveillance of ordinary Americans in 2013, the Justice Department under the Trump administration secretly seized communications records for reporters at the Washington Post, CNN, and the New York Times. The Daily Beast suggested that Carlson was perhaps looking to get ahead of a potentially negative story about himself. And there is a clip that Carlson's spying claims began at the 1920 mark. It's unavailable, but yeah, so this is, this is definitely interesting and something to definitely keep eyes on, especially in the wake of other Fox News journalists being, I wouldn't say pressured, but being watched on by, by, the, by the Obama administration back, back in 2013. I think, there, I think David Rosen, of, uh, formerly of Fox News, was a part of that. And yeah, so this is definitely something to keep an eye on, and as Matt, Matt Vespa points out, uh, 
at Town Hall, there's something odd about this. And he wrote it, and he wrote a, a piece this morning. There was something out about the, in the NSA's response to, to Tucker Carlson's spying allegations. He dropped the allegation last night. Tucker, Fox News' as Tucker Carlson said a whistleblower came forward to allege that he and some of his staff are being spied on by the National Security Agency. They're monitoring their communications to find something, anything to remove a show from the air. But there is, now there is no solid evidence to back this up, but there is history. The FBI did spy on the Trump campaign in 2016. The FBI did falsify documents to obtain spy warrants on Americans. They've been unmasking of Trump officials on USA intelligence or NSA intelligence reports. They've done this before, and now it seems that they've restarted their dirty tricks campaign. What's worse is that no one is really denying it. There, there is a, a clip in, in a Daily Caller tweet. Tucker Carlson says a whistleblower told him he is being spat on by the NSA and that he filed a four-year re request for information. The Biden administration is spying on us. We have confirmed that. Now, the Biden White House could give a straight answer, and now we have this response from the NSA, which really, really doesn't deny it either. Techno, techno fog zeroed in on, on where things are fishy. NSA CSS tweeted out, a statement from the NSA regarding recent allegations. On June 28, 2021, Tucker Carlson alleged that the National Security Agency has been monitoring our electronic communications and is planning to leak them to take in an attempt to take the show off the air. This allegation is untrue. Tucker Carlson has never been an intelligence target of the agency, and the NSA has never had any plans to try and take his program off the air. NSA is a foreign intelligence mission. We target foreign powers to generate insights on foreign activities that can harm the United States, with limited exceptions, for example, an emergency. NSA may not target a U.S. citizen without a court order that explicitly authorizes the targeting. Katie Pavlich tweeted, in a reply, tweeted out, no replies, that's not weird at all. Daily Caller tweeted out, in response to the same tweet from the NSA that they turn off the replies. Now this is a carefully drafted denial by the NSA, likely coordinated by NSA leadership, as there are three separate allegations within Tucker's quote. To this we ask a key question, which allegation is untrue? Is it that the NSA has been monitoring Tucker's electronic communications? Is it that the NSA is planning to leak Tucker's communications? Or is it that the NSA will try to take Tucker's show off the air? Here is the NSA. Here, well, here the NSA is using vague language to mislead the public. The press will run this in a, as a wholesale denial, and many in America will, will agree. Those who look closely will see something else. That the NSA, while stating that Tucker has never been an intelligence target, does not categorically deny having his electronic communications. Something is up. We know that the intelligence community is woke. They turn on Trump. They leaked information to hamstring his administration via the Russian collusion hoax. They've done this before, folks. Sorry, I simply cannot believe a simple thing that comes from these people's mouths. And neither can I, but, you know, I, I mean, it is a government, and as I had said a couple of times, to steal a... A phrase from Norm Peterson of Cheers, which was played by George Wen. Politics and Washington is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and, we're, and we are wearing milk bone underwear. But, yeah, so things are definitely uh, strange and odd, and there's this little beauty from the Daily Beast on... Uh, uh, on this as well. It says Tucker claims the NSA is spying on him to take down his show. This is scary. They did this for political reasons. The Biden administration is spying on us. We have confirmed that. Carlson Lundy said on Monday night. Fox News host Tucker Carlson dropped a bombshell claim on Monday night against the U.S. government, declaring that a whistleblower had informed him that the National Security Agency was actively spying on his communications in an effort to take his show off the air. 
In recent weeks, Carlson has spun a largely baseless conspiracy that the FBI was to blame for the Capitol, for the January 6th Capitol insurrection, inciting a far right, inciting a far right website to make the assertion that the, that the presence of unindicted co-conspirators in the opening and in, in the ensuing indictments means FBI agents were actively involved with organizing the seditious Capitol riots, and besides, Carlson funded fundamentally misunderstanding the role of cooperating witnesses after the fact. Legal experts have pointed out that government agents cannot be named as unindicted co-conspirators. During Monday's broadcast of his primetime Fox show, Carlson once again defended his claims about the FBI, though this time he incredibly, he, noticed, he noticeably softened the language of his prior assertion that the insurrection was a government false flag. The war on terror, now ongoing for 20 years, has pivoted. It is now being waged against American citizens, opponents of the regime, the, the Red Wing host said. We saw this on display on January 6th, we told you a couple of weeks ago, based on the language and publicly available indictments, that the FBI had full knowledge of the riots of the Capitol that day, and the agents we, that we spoke to confirmed that that is true. The FBI had sources in that crowd, confidential sources, snitches, that's 100% certain. After claiming the FBI had merely had prior knowledge of the rioters' intentions because it had sources in the crowd, Carlson, made a, Carlson suddenly made a stunning accusation. The federal government itself was snooping on him and for the sole purpose of winning his show. But it's not just political protests that the government is spying on, Carlson exclaimed. Yesterday, we heard from a whistleblower within the U.S. government who reached out to warn us that the NSA, the National Security Agency, is monitoring our electronic communications and is planning to leak them in an attempt to take the show off the air. Insisting he would normally be skeptical of a shocking claim as it is a crime and the U.S. isn't a third world country, the Fox star nonetheless said he knew for a fact that the NSA absolutely did spy on him. The whistleblower, who is in a position to know, repeated back to us information about a story that we are working on that can only have come from my text and emails, he said. There is no other possible source for that information, period. They did it for political reasons. The Biden administration is spying on us, and we have confirmed that. Carlson claimed that he had filed a Freedom of Information Act request demanding all information that the NSA and other government agency have, agencies have gathered on him and his show. He then appeared to call on Congress and act on his behalf. Only Congress can force transparency on the intelligence agencies and they should do that immediately, he concluded. Spying on opposition journalists is incompatible with democracy. They're doing it to us and again. They're definitely doing it to us. They're almost certainly doing it to others. This is scary and we need, and we need to stop it right away. Now it remains to be seen if any proof will come out of the Biden uh, will come out that the Biden administration is using spy agencies to take down Cow Tucker Carlson tonight, or if the Fox News star is looking to get ahead of a potentially negative story, as we've seen him do in the past. And that's that. But yeah, I mean, we've seen this many times. Both both Republicans and conservatives are or both Republicans and Democrats have, have done it in the past, you know, so, so there's a lot of shaky stuff going on. I'm going to keep a lookout on it. As a matter of fact, I have a couple of more articles, which I will bring to you tomorrow on this, but in the comment down below, tell me what, what you think about this. Do you think that, that the NSA is spying on on Tucker Carlson to, to shut his show down? Do you think that the, do you think the, that the NSA is spying on other journalists and or regular civilians? You know, do you, just what do you think is happening out there? Leave a comment down below. I'll leave the, the links to the article is in the show notes below, and I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday, Bill Cosby had his sex assault conviction overturned, and he is free from prison. Got this from the Associated Press, uh, as well as uh, other uh, sites. 
From the AP first, Bill Cosby free from prison as sex conviction overturned by, by Mary Claire Dale. Pennsylvania's highest court throughout Bill Cosby's sexual assault conviction and released him from, from prison Wednesday in a stunning reversal of fortune for, for the comedian most known as America's Dad. Ruling that the prosecutor who brought the case was bound by his predecessor's agreement not to charge Cosby. Cosby, 83, flashed the V for victory sign of a helicopter overhead as he trudged into his suburban Philadelphia home after ne serving nearly three years of a three to ten year sentence for drugging and violating Temple Sports U or Temple University Sports Administrator, uh, Administrator Andrea Constand in 2004. The former Cosby show star, the first celebrity tried and convicted in the hashtag MeToo era, had no comment as he arrived and just smiled and nodded later at a news conference table, where his lawyer, Jennifer Bonjean, said, We are thrilled at Mr. Cosby home. He served three years of an unjust sentence, and he did it, and he did it with dignity and purpose, she added. In a statement, Constanta and her lawyers called the ruling disappointing, and they, like many other advocates, expressed fear that it could discharge sexual assault victims from coming forward. We urge all victims to have their voices heard, they added. Cosby was arrested in 2015 when a district attorney armed with newly installed evidence, the comics damaging de deposition in a, in a lawsuit brought on by Constand, filed charges against him just days before the 20 or 12 year statute of limitations was about to run out. But the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said Wednesday that district attorney Kevin Steele, who made the decision to arrest Cosby, was obligated to stand by his predecessor's promise not to charge Cosby so there was no evidence that agreement was ever put in writing. Justice David Weck, writing for a split court, said Cosby had relied on the previous district attorney's decision not to charge him when the comedian gave his potentially incriminating testimony in Constance's civil case. The court called Cosby's subsequent arrest an affront to fundamental fairness, particularly when it results in a criminal prosecution that was foregone for more than a decade. It said justice and fair play, play and decency require that the district attorney's office stand by the decision of the previous DA. Now the justices said that overturning the, the conviction and bearing any for the prosecution is the only remedy that comports with society's reasonable expectations of its elected prosecutors in our criminal justice system. Cosby was promptly set free from the, sub, from the state prison in suburban Montgomery County and driven home. What we saw today was justice, justice for all Americans, said a Cosby spokesperson, Andrew Wyatt. Mr. Cosby's conviction being overturned is for the world and for all Americans who were, treated, who were being treated unfairly by the judicial system and some bad officers. Bonjean said Cosby was extremely happy to be home and looks forward, forward to reuniting with his wife and children. Several supporters outside yelled, hey, 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 the catchphrase of Cosby's animated Fat Albert character, which brought a smile from him. He later tweeted an old photo of himself with his first raise and eyes closed with the caption, I have never changed my stance nor my story. I have always maintained my innocence. Thank you to all my fans, supporters, and friends who stood by me through this ordeal. Special thanks to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court for upholding the rules of law. In a statement, Steele, the, the district attorney said Cosby went free on a procedural issue that is irrelevant to the facts of, of the crime. He commended, com he commended Constant for coming forward and added, my hope is that this decision will not dampen the, re the reporting of sexual assaults by victims. I'm furious to hear this news, wrote uh, uh, actor Amber Tamlin, founder of Time's Up, an advocacy group for sex crimes victims, said on Twitter, I personally know women who this man drugged and raped while unconscious. Shame on the court and this decision. But Cosby Show closed our Phyllis Felicia Rashad tweeted, finally, a terrible wrong is being righted and a miscarriage of justice is corrected. Four Supreme Court justices formed the majority of their ruling Cosby's favor, favor while three others dissented in whole or in part. Peter Goldberger, a suburban Pennsylvania lawyer with an expertise in criminal appeals, said prosecutors could ask the Pennsylvania Supreme Court for a re argument or reconsideration, but it could be a very long shot. I can't imagine that with such a lengthy opinion with a thoughtful concurring opinion and a thoughtful dissenting opinion, that you could honestly say that they made a simple mistake that would change their minds if they point out, if they pointed out to them, Goldberger said. And even though Cosby was charged only with the assault on Constand, 
The judge at his trial allowed five other accusers to testify that they too were similarly victimized by Cosby and Lee in the 1980s. Prosecutors called them as witnesses to establish what they said was a, was a pattern of behavior on Cosby's part. Cosby's lawyers had argued on appeal that the use of the five additional accusers was improper, but the Pennsylvania High Court did not weigh in, in on the question, saying it was moot given the finding that Cosby should not have been prosecuted in the first place. In sentencing Cosby, the trial judge had declared him a sexually violent predator who could not be safely allowed out in public and needed to report to authorities for the rest of his life. In May, Cosby was denied parole after refusing to participate in sex offender programs by and bars. He said he would resist the treatment programs and refuse to acknowledge wrongdoing even if it meant serving the full 10 years. A groundbreaking black actor who grew up in public housing in Philadelphia made a fortune estimated at $400 million during his 50 years in the entertainment industry. That included the TV shows I Spy, The Cosby Show, and Fat Albert along with comedy albums and a multitude of television commercials. The suburban, the suburban Philadelphia prosecutor, who originally looked into Constance's allegations, Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce Castor, considered the case flawed because Constant waited a year to come forward and stayed in contact with Cosby afterward. Castor declined, declined to prosecute and instead encouraged Constant to sue for damages. Question under oath as part of the lawsuit, Cosby said he used to offer quaaludes to women who, who he wanted to have sex with. He eventually settled with Constant for $3.4 million. Portions of the deposition became public at the request of the Associated Press and spelled Cosby's downfall, opening the floodgates on accusations from other women and destroying the comic's good guy reputation and career. More than 60 women came forward to say Cosby violated them. The AP does not typically identify sexual assault victims without the permission, with cons which consent has granted. Cosby in the deposition acknowledged giving quaaludes to, to a 19-year-old woman before having sex with her at a Las Vegas hotel in 1976. Cosby called the, the encounter consensual. On Wednesday, the woman, Therese Seringis, now 64, said the court ruling takes my breath away. I think, the, I think it's a miscarriage of justice. This is about procedure. It's not about the truth of the woman, she said. She, she also said she took solace in the fact that Cosby served only three years, or nearly three years behind bars. That's as good as it gets in America for sex crime victims. And there's this from BuzzFeed News. This is why Cosby's rape conviction was overturned. Bill Cosby walked out of prison on Wednesday afternoon, two years into what was supposed to be a sentence of three to ten years after he was found guilty of raping Andrea Constand at his home in 2004. Hours earlier, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had tossed out the conviction. What happened? A majority of the state justices concluded that Cosby's constitutional rights had been violated when local prosecutors in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, charged him in 2015. The problem with that criminal case, the court found, was that a previous district attorney had announced a decade earlier that Cosby would not face prosecution. That announcement triggered a series of events that included Cosby providing incriminating information against himself in a civil lawsuit, which eventually became part of the criminal prosecution he was under the impression would, would never happen. It's an extraordinary situation that, as the court noted in Wednesday's decision, was without precedent. The problem wasn't just that then Montgomery County District Attorney Bruce Castor had made an unusual public commitment outside the normal process for an immunity agreement. It also wasn't just that a later district attorney went back on Castor's public pledge. The court found that Cosby's decision to rely on Castor's statement and, and incriminate himself in the civil case, and to then have those statements used against him, ran so far afoul of his due process rights that the only way to fix it was to throw out the entire prosecution. We do not dispute that this remedy is both severe and rare, but it is warranted here, indeed compelled. Justice David Weck wrote for the majority, society holds a strong interest in the prosecution of crimes. It is also true that no such interest, however important, can ever eclipse society's interest in ensuring that the constitutional rights of the people were vindicated. The wheels, have been set, the wheels have been set in motion in 2005 when Castor first learned about Constance's allegations against Cosby. That a year earlier, the, the actor had given her pills that caused her to become incapacitated and then sexually assaulted her. 
But Castro ultimately wasn't convinced that his office could prove the case in court, given that Constant waited a year to file her complaint with law enforcement. There also was no forensic evidence, and Castro believed Constant's recollections would be less precise. Castor told Cosby's team and importantly stated in a February 2005 press release that he would not bring criminal charges related to Constance's allegation. Castor, who more recently defended former President Donald Trump in his February impeachment trial, later testified that his intent was to try to still up Constance get justice by taking a criminal prosecution off the table. Castor believed that it would prevent Cosby from invoking his Fifth Amendment right and self-incrimination in Constance's civil lawsuit. Now fast forward a decade. In 2015, when dozens of women began making similar accusations against Cosby, documents in Constance's civil case were unsealed in response for media requests. Then District Attorney Rita Ritteri Furman then reopened the criminal investigation that her predecessor had closed. Cassie wrote to Furman warning her about his public promise to Cosby, but she, closed it, but she chose to pass on. Her successor, Kevin Steele, formally charged Cosby in December 2015 with three counts of aggravated assault. A jury eventually found Cosby guilty in April 2018. He was sentenced several months later, and in addition to the prison term, he was required to register as a sexual predator. Castor would later say that he had intended to block local, local prosecutors from bringing criminal charges against Cosby related to Constance's allegations at any point in the future. But he did not get Constance's consent to make this decision or even communicate his promise to Constance or her lawyers. She learned about it from a reporter. He also didn't negotiate a formal immunity statement with Cosby and presented it to a judge to get an official order that would be legally binding on the district attorney's office going forward. Instead, as the Pennsylvania Supreme Court described it, Castor's statement was a unilateral exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Lower courts that consider Cosby's case found this sequence of events cut against Cosby's argument that it was reasonable for him to rely on Castor's statement when he decided to testify against his own interests. Cosby ended up sitting for four depositions in Constance's civil lawsuit during which he confessed to several incriminating acts, including providing quaaludes to the women he wanted to have sex with, though he insisted he just gave Con Constance Benadryl. Eventually, Constance settled, settled the suit for $3.38 million, but the state Supreme Court had a different interpretation of the legal heft of Castor's announcement, even if there hadn't been a formal immunity agreement. We hold that when a prosecutor makes a conditional guarantee or promise of non-prosecution, and when the defendant relies upon that guarantee to the detriment of his constitutional right not to testify, the principle of fundamental fairness that undergirds due process of law in our criminal justice system demands that, that the promise be enforced, Wreck wrote. Two former prosecutors who reviewed the court's decision told BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed News that it was very common for prosecutors to tell defense attorneys that they don't plan to pursue charges, but normally they said officials don't put out press releases about it. I've been a prosecutor for more than 40 years, and certainly I would periodically tell or even write to a defense lawyer saying we would decline to prosecute right now. Michael Levy, the former US, assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and a, a current law professor at the University of Pennsylvania, said, I would have never thought of that as meaning no matter what happened, we would never go ahead with the criminal case. What makes it highly unusual is the public nature of this, Shan Wu, a former federal prosecutor, said. Then there's a reliance by Cosby on that to say, okay, well, if I'm not facing any danger, I can t testify in the civil case. But Wu also questioned the, 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 the decision by Cosby's lawyers to let him testify at all, notwithstanding Castor's press release. Anytime you have a person who has been charged or accused formally, it's very, very risky to let them say anything ever, he said. If I were Cosby's attorney back then, I would have fought tooth and nail against him being, dis against him being deposed. The state Supreme Court said in their opinion that, despite the deposition testimony being a bad idea, it was reasonable for Cosby to rely on the advice of his lawyers and the then district attorney. We cannot deem it unreasonable to rely on, upon the advice of, men, of one's attorneys, Wecht wrote, a criminal defendant confronts a number of important decisions that may result in severe consequences to the defendant if and when they are made without a full understanding of the, intri of, of the in intricacies and nuances of the ever-changing criminal law. The court's decision was not unanimous, just as Thomas Saylor wrote that he did not, did not agree with the majority that Castor's special release was an unconditional promise. 
He said he believed that, that the release was a conventional public announcement meant by someone in a temporary elected position that would in no way be binding upon his own future decision-making processes, let alone those of his persons or uh, of his successor. Justice Kevin Doherty, joined by Chief Justice Max Baer, wrote separately to say he agreed with the majority that due process does not permit the government to exchange in this type of coercive bait, bait and switch, but he disagreed with tossing out the case entirely, writing that the appropriate outcome was a new trial where any evidence from Cosby's depositions were suppressed. Hours after the, after the decision was released, Steele Montgomery County's current district attorney said in a, in a statement that it should not deter victims of sexual assault from seeking justice. Cosby now goes free on a procedural issue that is irrelevant to the facts of the crime, Steele wrote. Prosecutors in my office will continue to follow the evidence whenever and to whomever it leads. We still believe that no one is above the law, including those who are rich, famous, and powerful. But in a statement to BuzzFeed News, Jennifer Von Jean, Cosby's current attorney, said that at the end of the day, there has to be a fair process. Prosecutors have to live up to their word. We cannot change decades in history of our treatment of women on the shoulders of one man, man or two men. Which is what seems to be happening, she said. There is a lot of work that needs to be done, and, and we, we can't undo the past simply by cheating and breaking the rules and disregarding our cherished constitutional principles just because it makes us feel good. And that's so true. I mean, okay, I admit I did not follow the, the trial in its entirety, but... You know, based on what had been seen and heard from these attorneys, I think that I think that it may, may just be a good thing. Fox News also had a has a take on it from a legal perspective. This coming from FoxNews.com by Jessica Napoli. How did Bill Cosby's conviction overturn happen? Legal experts weigh in. Bill Cosby's sex, sex assault conviction was overturned by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court on Wednesday. The actor 83 was released from prison after a court ruled that the prosecutor who brought the case was bound by his predecessor's agreement not to charge Cosby. Philip Dubé, a Los Angeles County public or deputy public defender who was not involved in the case, told Fox News that the comedian, once dubbed America's dad, was released because he was denied due process and the benefit of an immunity agreement reached between him and prosecutors during civil litigation brought by his victims. In exchange for, for testifying at civil de depositions, the elected DA in office at the time granted Cosby immunity from prosecution. That agreement lives beyond the term of, in office of the elected DA at the time, he explained. In 2018, Cosby was convicted of drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constand, a Tumba University employee at a suburban Pennsylvania state back in 2004. The disgrace, with the disgrace Cosby shows there has served more than two years of a three to 10 year sentence at a state prison near Pennsylvania or near Philadelphia. Niyama Ramani, president of West Coast Trial Lawyers, who is, not, who is also not involved in Cosby's case, told Fox News that this overturn is unprecedented. There is a district attorney in Pennsylvania who declined to prosecute Cosby, he said referencing Bruce Castor, who was a Montgomery district attorney at the time. Castor made a very public statement saying we're not going to prosecute Bill Cosby because of insufficient evidence. Relying on that statement, Cosby and in a, and in a subsequent civil case, not a criminal case, was unable to invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. During the depositions, Cosby gives very incriminating and damaging statements, then there's a new DA and that person decides to prosecute the case, Ramani said in reference. After the new DA takes over and during the, the prosecution, the DA uses, these very, or uses those very damaging statements that Cosby made during his civil, de civil deposition so what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court essentially said was, look, you can't do this. Even though, even though there was no formal immunity, Cosby reasonably relied on that statement, declining prosecution when he gave his deposition in the civil case, which is why he was so open. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court said that District Attorney Kevin Steele, who made the decision to arrest Cosby, 
was obligated to stand by his predecessor's promise not to pro not to charge Cosby. Cosby was charged in 2018 based on evidence that would be inadmissible, Ramani said. He testified truthfully, but he did so under the assumption that there would be no prosecution. The court called Cosby's arrest an affront to fundamental fairness, particularly when it results in a criminal prosecution that was foregone for more than a decade. The justices said that overturning the conviction and barring any further prosecution is the only remedy that comports with society's reasonable expectations of its elected prosecutors and our criminal justice system. And, and that's that, but yeah, so that's interesting uh, in, in, in of itself. And and now earlier we had seen for seen from a an actress uh, that Cosby should still be in jail. There is this coming from USA Today, and it says Felicia Rashad said uh, says the terrible wrong was being read after Bill Cosby's conviction overturned. Other celebs agree this by Marina Petofsky. The former Cosby show staff, Felicia Rashad, celebrates after Bill Cosby's conviction is overturned. A miscarriage of justice is corrected. The actress wrote on social media Wednesday. While Rashad praised the news of Cosby's release, others took to social media to condemn the move. Cosby has served more than two years of a 3D to 10 years since at a state prison near Philadelphia. That's the story's highlights. Here's the story. Felicia, Felicia Rashad, who played Bill Cosby's wife, Claire Huxable, on The Cosby Show, took to social media Wednesday to applaud Pennsylvania's Supreme Court decision to overturn Cosby's sex assault conviction. The court found in a, that in, in an agreement with the previous prosecutor, man Cosby could not be charged in the case. Prosecutors also said that it blocked the possibility of a third trial in the case. Rashad lauded the court's decision as a terrible wrong being righted. A miscarriage of justice is corrected. Rashad added on Twitter alongside a photo of Cosby, who has since been released from state prison. In a follow-up tweet, Rashad wrote, I fully support survivors of sexual assault coming forward, adding that her post was in no way intended to be insensitive to their truth. Personally, I know from friends and family that such abuse has lifelong residual effects, the actor added. My heartfelt wishes for healing. Cosby, 83, was convicted in 2018 of drugging and molesting Andrea Constant, a Temple University employee, in 2004 at a suburban Philadelphia state. Howard University, where Rashad was recently named Dean of Fine Arts, issued a statement in response to the actress's tweet saying the personal opinions of the le of, of leadership do not re reflect the universities. While Dean Rashad has acknowledged in her follow-up tweet that victims must be heard and believed, her initial tweet tweet lacked sensitivity towards survivors of sexual assault. The, the statement read, we will continue to advocate for, for survivors fully and support their right to be heard. Cosby was charged in late 2015 when a prosecutor under newly unsaid evidence is damaging deposition from her lawsuit, arrested him days before the 12-year statute of limitations expired. Constance said in a joint statement with her attorneys Dolores M. Troiani and B.B. Kivitz that the decision was not only disappointing but of concern and that it may discourage those who seek justice for sexual assault in the criminal justice system from reporting or participating in the prosecution of the assailant or may force a victim to choose between filing either a criminal or a civil action. Cosby has served more than two years of a three to 10 years since at a state prison near Pennsylvania or should be near Philadelphia. He has vowed to serve all 10 years rather than acknowledge any remorse over the encounter with Constand. While now, while while Rashad praised the result of Cosby's release, other celebrities condemned the move. To every woman who was a sexual abuse, who was sexual assaulted by Bill Cosby, my heart longs for you today, and I am full fury. Actor Deborah Messing tweeted, "It's horrifying." Dylan Farrell, who accused her adoptive father Woody Allen of sexually molesting her when she was a child, labeled the news as a perfect example of how not just our society but our justice system 
continually fail survivors of sexual assault, for those who question myself and other survivors about the reasons and timing of coming forward, I hope that today will serve a teachable moment on empathy and why it takes years, if ever, to, for someone to discuss their abuse, she wrote. Many survivors will look at the events of today and decide that it's not worth it, that even when justice is served, it can be taken away. Actor and activist Amber Tamlin tweeted, I don't want to hear any, anything about how cancel culture ruined men's lives during the Me Too era reckoning for women and survivors. How we went too far today, news that Cosby's conviction is being overturned is proof that we haven't gone far enough. Our justice system must change, she added. In a statement to the Associated Press, Anita Hill, chair of the Hollywood Commission, said that the ruling demonstrates how failures in our criminal justice systems make accountability for sexual assault impossible. Hill added systems that ensure accountability for powerful abusers, abu prevent protect workers and prevent agreements that shield abusers are urgently needed in entertainment and other industries. Dr. Gare, or actor Josh Gad wrote on Twitter, victims of sexual assault deserve better than whatever the expletive just happened in Pennsylvania. Author Abraham X. Kendi said he believes the survivors. Anna Navarro Cardenas, political strategist and commentator, took to Twitter to thank the dozens of women who came, who've come forward with, with, with allegations against Cosby. Thank you to all those who had the courage to speak up and seek justice, she wrote. He was not in vain. He served two years. We all know what he did. And they made it easier for the for other women to come forward. Actor was on her catch. She, she knows how, or she knows so many women and men who were so afraid to press charges against their rapists and re-traumatized themselves on Twitter. I am heartbroken today to hear the news of Cosby's release, she added. This is sickening. My heart is with my sisters. They're survivors. We, still, we have work to do. When will things get better for women, and, for women and girls regarding sexual assault, sexism, misogyny, and ageism? Kathy Griffin tweeted. What will it take? So discouraged. Cosby was the first celebrity tried and convicted in the wake of the Me Too movement. And that's that, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it is tough, you know, when, when stuff like this happens, you know, I mean, do, do come forward if, if you have been assaulted, you know, and do so immediately now. Okay, I am a fan of Bill Cosby, don't get me wrong. And, and, what, and what he did was terrible, yes. However, if the if the victims come forward, then they would then then one I don't think that there would be all all of this pile up. Two, you know, it'd give a short window of of time for for everything to to come to pass, and yeah, so. I'll, I might, I might talk more about this later, but in the comment section below, leave, leave your thoughts on this. Do you agree with that Cosby's conviction should be overturned? Do you not agree? Do you support the Me Too movement? Or, and do you think that, can, that cancel culture has ruined men's lives? Leave a comment down below. I'll leave a list of, of, of links to the articles that I've read in, in the show notes, and I'll see you in the next video. Yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 in favor of Arizona's voter voting regulations. This is coming from my good friends over at townhall.com. And Madeleine Leesman, Supreme Court upholds Arizona's voting regulations left us lose their minds. On Thursday, the, the, the Supreme Court upheld Arizona's voting laws, challenged by the Democrat National Committee that target ballot harvesting and out-of-piecing voting, causing a liberal uproar, uh, uproar on social media. In the ruling, the High Court ruled six, or 
voted 6-3, siding with Arizona Attorney General Mike Brnovich, that Arizona's voting laws are not discriminatory or in violation of the Voting Rights Act. The court upheld that votes cast in the wrong precinct would be thrown away and a, in fact a full-fledged ban on ballot harvesting. Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Thomas, and Barrett held a majority. Voters who choose to vote in person on election day in a county that uses a precinct system must vote in their assigned precincts. Justice Alito vote for the majority opinion. Having to identify one's own polling place and then travel there to vote does not exceed the usual burdens of voting. Liberal media moguls pounce on the news, claiming that the court's ruling perpetuates discrimination and gives Republicans more leverage to claim the 2020 election was stolen. One of the things that, that's left open to the possibility of voting rights laws that enacted with a discriminatory purpose in mind, said MSNBC guest Melissa Murray on air today. Much more of this kind of work is going to be sub rosa, much more subtle than it was in the Jim Crow era. I really think this is the gutting of this landmark civil rights legislation. Townhall.com tweeted out earlier today, MSNBC guest says that the discriminatory purpose of Arizona voting laws are going to be sub rosa, much more subtle than it was in the Jim Crow era. I think this really is a gutting of the landmark civil rights legislation. Mary wasn't the only mainstream media guest to push the narrative that the Supreme Court is upholding voting laws in a scheme to prevent minorities from voting. ABC News Live reported, re reported Devin Dwyer spoke on the subject, where he also corroborated the belief that voting rules or restrictions, as the label as the liberal media has dubbed it, are rooted in discrimination. With all of these laws proliferating, making it harder for people to, to get absentee ballots, to wait in line at polling places to drop off their ballots in future elections. Democrats and civil rights activists see discrimination, Dwyer said in the segment. It's going to be harder now for Democrats and civil rights advocates to challenge the state voting laws in court. The court system has been the sort of the last line of defense against this wave of voting laws passed just in the past few months in the wake of the 2020 election, in the wake of the lies pushed by President Trump and Republicans that there was widespread voter fraud, that this was somehow a botched election. On Twitter, some, liberal, some, new, some numer or numerous liberal lawmakers, reporters and the like expressed their disappointment in the ruling, continuously noting how discriminatory it is to protect election integrity by disallowing ballot harvesting in and out of, and out of precinct voting. Adrian Fonts tweeted out, Today's Supreme Court ruling is more than disappointing. It will disenfranchise Amer or Arizona voters and validate the baseless voter fraud me mythology. Access to fundamental rights like voting should always be expanded, not restricted. Senator Alex Padilla tweeted out, make no mistake, six conservative Supreme Court justices just voted to make it even harder to, harder to protect black and brown Americans' right to vote. Tragically, this decision will only embolden future voter suppression efforts across the country. It's time for Congress to step up. He also said that Congress must act to protect and expand voting rights for Americans. As well, Levin tweeted out, any word about Arizona senators on what they think about the Supreme Court upholding voter suppression in their states? Any renewed commitment from them to protect the rights of their voters? Representative Mondaire Jones tweeted out, as the Supreme Court's assault on the Voting Rights Act continues, Congress can, can and must fight back. A new bill with Representative Ruben Gallego will undo the latest attack on the VRA by outlawing discriminatory voter suppression laws, like the ones the court just upheld in Minovich. This in a reply or to NPR, which says breaking the Supreme Court is now the only remaining section of a 1965 Voting Rights Act, rendering the landmark civil rights law close to a dead letter. The 6 3 vote was along ideological lines with the liberal justices dissenting. Stevie Van Zandt tweeted out lots of bad news today, none worse so far than the Supreme Court upholding voting suppression, which will lead to more. Goes together with their terrible 2013 decision to cut the Voting Rights Act of 65. I've said it before, we need to stack the court now, six new members now. On the side of the aisle, plenty of Republican lawmakers express support of the Supreme Court's ruling. Governor Christy Noem of South Dakota tweeted out, I applaud the SCOTUS decision today in the Benovich case. I agree for this result in my amicus brief supporting Arizona's common sense voting laws. 
We need to protect the precious right to vote, and Justice Alito defends this truth in his decision today. Nancy Mays tweeted out, Supreme Court upholds Arizona Voting Rights Act. They are fixed it for you. This, they sent a picture from U, U.S. politics that apparently was on Twitter. Supreme Court upholds Arizona voting restrictions, trending with Voting Rights Act and SCOTUS. Senator Melissa Melendez tweeted out, the Supreme Court issued two critical rulings today. Arizona ballot harvesting limits were upheld, and the California nonprofit donor harassment law was struck down. It's a great day. Congressman Byron Donalds of Southwest Florida tweeted out, I am proud that the Supreme Court voted to, up to uphold Arizona voting laws and reject the ludicrous claims that these laws are racist. The rule by law and our electoral process should be guided by law, not, identi not identity politics. This, in a, in a repost of town halls that, that says breaking the Supreme Court rules that Arizona voting rules do not violate the Voting Rights Act and were not enacted with a racially discriminatory purpose. Mike Brnovich tweeted out, I am thankful that we're yeah, I am thankful the, that the justice of the, this has upheld state's ability to pass and maintain common sense election laws at a time when our country needed it, needs it most. He wrote this on Twitter at 10.16 yesterday. And I mean, I totally agree with that, but there is some... Uh, on the left, I don't. I have one from CNN, which I'll get to a little later. But first, there's this from Vox.com. The Supreme Court just made Citizens United even worse. In its infamous decision in Citizens, in Citizens United versus USC or FEC in 2010, the Supreme Court tossed a bone to lawmakers seeking to regulate money in politics. With a few exceptions, Citizens United stripped the government of its power to limit the amount of spending on elections, especially by corporations. But the decision also gave the court's blessing to nearly all laws requiring campaigns and political donations to disclose their donors. They have now stripped most of the lingering meat off that bone. On Thursday, the court handed down a 6-3 decision in Americans for Prosperity Foundation Rebonta, which flips U.S. with Citizens United's approach to disclosure laws on its head. Before Thursday, the court treated most disclosure laws as valid, and it typically only allowed plaintiffs who objected to such a law to seek an exemption from it, not to seek a court order, not to seek a court order striking down the law altogether. After Americans for Prosperity, there is now a presumption that all such laws are unconstitutional. Although this presumption might be rebuttable in some cases, as Justice Sonia Sotomayor writes in a dissenting opinion, today's analysis marks reporting and disclosure requirements with a bullseye. The upshot is that wealthy donors now have far more ability to shape American politics in secret, and that ability is only likely to grow as judges rely on the decision in Americans for prosperity to strike down other donor disclosure laws. Americans for Prosperity was brought by two conservative organizations, the Americans for Prosperity Foundation, a, conserv a conservative advocacy group closely associated with the billionaire Koch brothers, and the Thomas More Law Center, a conservative law firm that claims they were supported, were formed to promote America's Judeo-Christian heritage against a California regulation requiring charities that wish to raise tax-deductible -deduct funds in Arizona to disclose their largest contributors to the state's attorney to the state attorney general's office. So the actual law at issue in this case is fairly far afield from actual campaigns for political office. But Justice John Roberts' opinion for himself and his fellow conservative justices has broad implications for all donor disclosure laws. It writes a new legal standard that will allow, allow many future changes to him to those laws to succeed, and it will also li likely lead to sweeping victories for many of the plaintiffs in such suits. Americans for Prosperity destroys a consensus that used to exist between liberal and conservative judges or justices. Not long ago, there was a broad consensus that, con that, with, that, that disclosure laws aren't just permissible, but essential in a democracy. 
as Justice Antonin Scalia wrote in a 2010 opinion, requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage, without which democracy is doomed. For my part, I do not look forward to a society which, thanks to the Supreme Court, campaigns anonymously and even exercises the, the direct democracy of initiative and referendum, hidden from public scrutiny and protected from the accountability of criticism. This does not resemble the home of the brave. Well, that consensus is now dead. Much of the court's right flank spent the oil spent the oral argument in Americans for Prosperity, rejecting Scalia's civic courage in favor of a kind of paranoia over cancel culture. Justice Neil Gorsuch warned that the government could demand to see your Christmas card list or to disclose your dating history to state regulators. Justice Samuel Alito spoke of vandalism, death threats, physical violence, economic reprisals, and harassment in the workplace directed against donors to an anti-LGBTQ campaign. Under, a previous cons under the previous consensus, the one announced in Citizens United, disclosure laws would be upheld so long as there is a substantial relation between the disclosure requirement and a sufficiently important governmental interest. Moreover, while some disclosure laws might be vulnerable to challenge, the court typically only permitted as applied challenges, meaning that the plaintiff could seek an exemption from a particular disclosure law, but the law would still apply to other individuals or organizations. In other words, most, most disclosure laws were valid, and the onus was on the donors who wanted secrecy to prove that they actually deserved it. The court's previous decisions, moreover, this was suggested that the bar for bringing such an, uh, such an as-applied challenge is fairly high. The seminal decision establishing that similar organizations must be exempted from disclosure laws is NAACP versus Alabama X. Albert Patterson, 1958, which was an attempt by the state of Alabama to force the NAACP, then the nation's preeminent civil rights organization, to disclose its membership. Had the NAACP done so, Alabama could have turned those names over to the Ku Klux Klan, among other, uh, other things. The plaintiffs and Americans for Prosperity do allege that they were the victims of death threats and other sorts of inexcusable activity. Roberts points to uh, a statement from someone working in the same building as the AAP Foundation, who said he could easily walk into the, CF or into the CEO's office and slit his throat. But nothing that even approaches the constant threat of terroristic violence that civil rights activists faced in the Jim Crow South. In any event, as Sotomayor writes in her dissent, she would be sympathetic to a decision that simply granted as applied relief to these plaintiffs because of the threats they face, but the court goes much further, striking down California's disclosure rules in their face, meaning that they are now invalid for everyone. The court writes the legal standard governing disclosure laws, as mentioned above. Citizens United upheld that disclosure laws would be upheld so long as there is a substantial relation between the disclosure requirement and a sufficiently important governmental interest. Roberts' opinion abandons that standard, holding that disclosure laws must be newly tailored to advance the government's interest in requiring disclosure. Most first-year law students will immediately recognize the significance of those two words, narrowly tailored, as it is part of the test that the Supreme Court applies when it wishes to impose a very high presumption that certain laws are unconstitutional. The court, for example, imposes a narrow tailoring requirement on laws that discriminate on the basis of race. So Americans for Prosperity does not go quite far as it could have. It does not apply a test known as strict scrutiny, the most skeptical test the court applies in constitutional challenges, it comes pretty daggone close. When the court applies a narrow tailoring requirement, it signals that a law will typically be struck down if the government could have advanced its goal in some other ways. The practical impact of Americans for Prosperity is that all disclosure laws, including campaign disclosure laws, and now vulnerable if a plaintiff can think of some other hypothetical way that the government might have fostered the goal of the transparency. Roberts justified that even a result, or Roberts justified such a result because he claims that disclosure requirements can chill association, even if there is no disclosure to the general public. 
he fears, in other words, a world in which donors will choose not to donate to groups like the Americans for Prosperity Foundation out of fear that their names will be disclosed. And then, of course, there is a shift from, a, from as applied to facial challenges. Rather than simply doling out exemptions to disclosure laws, courts are now much more likely to strike them down in their entirety. The decision is, simply put, a disaster for anyone hoping to know how wealthy donors influence American politics. Now, right there, y you had seen two separate articles, one supporting the, the Supreme Court's law and one objecting to the, to, the, to the Supreme Court's law. I mean, I've said it many times here, and I'll, and I'll keep saying it. Politics is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and and we're just wearing milk bone underwear. But yeah, I'm, I mean, it. I personally agree with that law simply because number one, the you know most of the election laws are. I wouldn't quite call them outdated per se, but some of them on, their, on paper might be good, but in actual, but in all actuality, they need a little tweaking here and there. And now ballot harvesting, I disagree with. Another thing that that I, that I disagree with is the liberal saying that we need six new justices on the court now which is akin to, to the court packing that we always hear of, hear about and that many ac accuse the conservatives of doing. Court packing is when you add justices to the, to the court above the, above the, the number that's there now. Okay. Like, Case in point is what FDR did back in the 1930s. He wanted, okay, I think the justices stood at nine. He wanted in it as much as 15 on there just so there would be, you know, justices that were more, more justices that would agree to, to most all of his New, New Deal reg, regulations, even though Congress and uh, and most Americans did, did not want that. So and yeah, and there there's this from Hot Air and Jazz Jazz Shaw. School to suppose Arizona voting integrity laws. Arizona Democrats had sought to throw out two voting integrity laws passed in that state in 2016. Those laws have been used as a model for new laws passed in other states since the 2020 elections, so the precedent in this case could prove important. One of the laws states that only the voter, a member of the family, or their caregiver can give a completed or can, can deliver a completed ballot. The other law requires election officials to reject ballots cast in the wrong precinct. Today, the Supreme Court announced that they found the laws to be constitutional and null on the 63 vote. Be sure to know the spin that NBC News applies to their coverage of this story. The Supreme Court on Thursday upheld two election laws in the 2020 battleground state of Arizona that challengers said make it harder, harder for minorities to vote. The case was an important test for what's left of one of the nation's most important civil rights laws, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which, which, the, Supreme, which the Supreme Court scaled back in 2013. A remaining provision allows lawsuits claiming that voting changes would put minority voters at a disadvantage in electing candidates of their choice. Civil rights groups were hoping that the Supreme Court would would use the Arizona case to to strengthen their their ability to challenge the, the dozen of post twenty and twenty voting restrictions imposed by Republican legislatures in the wake of Donald Trump's defeat. We are, we are once again seeing the media adopting the insulting language of the Democrats every time they don't like a new election law. 
saying that the laws make it harder for the minority or, or make it harder for minorities to vote. I've yet to hear a single person explain that rationale coherently. In the Arizona example, the first law applies who can legally take a completed ballot to be submitted, limiting that choice to the voters themselves, their family members, or a caregiver. Now, is the plaintiff somehow claiming that minority voters don't have family members or the ability to get to their precinct? The second law requires where the second law rejects ballots cast in the wrong precinct. I'm sure that happens from time to time, but the assumption being made by the plaintiff seems to be that minority voters are not smart enough to locate the correct precinct while their white counterparts can manage the task. That's not a very really good look. Now regarding the second law, the plaintiffs had also claimed that officials move vote or move polling locations more often than in minority districts leading to confusion or, or mistakes. There were already rules in place, however, describing when and how polling locations can be changed. If they have proof that election officials have been violating the, those laws, the answer isn't to scrap this law. It's to investigate and arrest the people doing the switching. Now, what we seem to be lacking, or what we seem to be seeing here, is another example of the Supreme Court sticking to their traditional precedent of leaving the specifics of voting rules up to the individual states as long as they don't prove to be discriminatory. That's probably the reason that the Democrats continually accuse Republican officials of discrimination in crafting voting laws. But it's whether the rule concerning who can deliver a ballot, which was passed to cut down on ballot harvesting, or a requirement to vote in your own precinct, those laws apply equally to everyone, irregardless of race, gender, or, or any other demographic. Now that, the, now that there are challenges bubbling up over new voting laws in Georgia and many other states, today's decision will probably prove important. The lower courts will need to consider this case as precedent when hearing the others. And that is so totally true. In, you know, so we have, so right here, you know, as, as it was said, you know, the end, you know, you know, the answer so to, so to proof is not to scrap the law, but to investigate and arrest the people doing the switching, which leads to, you know, so, so we are seeing a lot of accusations of discrimination and crafting voting laws, but, you know, I mean, it just boils down to simple common sense, but with all this and you know, with all of these voting laws, I know that there, I know that Governor DeSantis had passed vo a voting law. I, I think it was restricting ballot harvesting or something of, of that sort. So the lower courts definitely will need to consider the the Arizona case says by the Supreme Court. At, from yesterday as as precedent so de definitely take a look into that and then there's this uh, opinion piece from CNN and it says Supreme Court deals blow to American democracy and this by Joshua Douglas, who is professor of the University of Kentucky's J. David Rosenberg College of Law. He specializes in election law, voting rights, and constitutional laws. He writes, eight years ago, the Supreme Court gutted a major portion of the Voting Rights Act in its infamous Shelby County versus Holder decision, making it easier for states with a history of voter discrimination to enact new onerous Voting rules. States like Georgia and Texas took notice, passing strict new voter ID laws, absentee ballot rules, and a host of other provisions that make it harder for some people to vote. The court just doubled down on that attack on the right to vote. The specific Arizona laws at issue in the Benerich case, which the court just decided by a 6 3 vote that fell on unpredictable ideological lines, are less momentous than the rule that the court laid down for future voting rights uh, cases. Still, while upholding the voting laws, the court made it much harder for voting rights advocates to protect against racial discrimination. Voting rights plaintiffs had filed suit against two Arizona laws, one that says that a vote will not count if a voter goes to the wrong precinct, and then finding their name not in the poll books, fills out a provisional ballot. 
The other limits who can collect and return completed ballots, known also known to, import to opponents as ballot harvesting. The plaintiffs argue that the laws violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits voting rules that have the effect of making it harder for minority voters to cast a ballot that will count. As expected, the court upheld both laws, reversing the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The question wasn't whether the voting rights advocates would lose this case, it was how badly they would lose. They lost the whole ball game. To be sure, the court did not completely gut Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Instead, the, minority, or the majority opinion delivered by Justice Samuel Alito was more subtle, offering five guideposts to construe the, the landmark civil rights statute. But each of these guideposts placed significant hurdles on voting rights plaintiffs to go, going forward, spelling bad news for equality and the right to vote. Put simply, it's death by a thousand cuts. Alito said that in analyzing whether a law results in vote denial on the basis of race, courts should consider, one, the overall burden on voters, two, whether the voting law has been around for a long time, three, the size of the impact on minority voters, four, the state's overall election scheme, and five, the state's interest in combating election fraud. Now, none of this is within the text of the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 simply says that, if a, says, says that a law is invalid if voting is not equally open to racial minorities and if it provides less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the political process. As Justice Elena Kagan wrote in her powerful dissent, the majority founds its decision on a list of mostly made-up factors at odds with Section 2 itself. For instance, whether a state has an interest in combating voter fraud, minuscule as it is, should have little bearing on the question of whether a law discriminates among voters. Now, whether some states have used the same rule for years should be irrelevant under the law. A law that, that currently produces a discriminatory effect harms voters in every election. Alito's opinion may also impact claims that a legislature passed a law with a discriminatory intent, which is the, the issue raised by Attorney General Merrick Garland's lawsuit filed last week against Georgia's new onerous voting law. Alito indicated that partisan motives are not the same as racial motives, meaning that a court could potentially reject the argument that race was Georgia's key motivation by focusing on the politics of the debate in the state legislature. There is no easy solution to this conundrum. Congress was considering or considering the vote the For the People Act, which would re require easy voting access across the country. But even though it passed, it, but even though it passed the, the U.S. House of Representatives, it stalled at the U.S. Senate. Congress is also considering the John Rights or John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but it is unclear if the bill has enough votes. State courts are still open to claims that voting laws violate state constitutions. And even after the court's decision, Section 2 is still able to ferret out the worst voting laws. Though the standard is now a lot tougher to meet, the court's decision is a stark reminder that it is no fan of voting rights. The thumb is firmly on the side of the states to regulate their, their elections as they wish, which in many places is bad news for American democracy. Number one, we are not a, a democracy, we are a republic. A in fact, we are a constitutional republic. And, you know, so nowhere in the, Const nowhere in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and by Constitution, I'm talking about U.S. Constitution, you know, the, the U.S. Constitution or the 50 state constitutions. You will not even find it listed in the Bill of Rights or other subsequent amendments. You won't even find it in the in the in the Federalist Papers. You know, you won't find it in, in the debates on the Constitution, whether at the 1787 Philadelphia Convention or in an, or in an individual state conventions thereafter, but so, you know, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it, it it's just mind-boggling that, that people say that, you know, you know, that, that we are a democracy, and, yeah, so, 
that ran is secured. Now we move on to to the daily signal, and the I and this by Thomas Jipping and David Brain, Bainbridge. Supreme Court upholds freedom of association. What would it take for the American Civil Liberties Union and the Independent Women's Law Center, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals and the Gun Owners of America, and the Human Rights Campaign and the Proposition Aid Legal Defense Fund to be found in the same trench finding the same opponent? Nothing less than the right to the freedom of association, which the, which the Supreme Court has held as implicit in the, in the, in the First Amendment, and Americans for Prosperity Foundation Rebonta, the Supreme Court on Thursday held by a 6-3 majority that California violated that right by demanding that charitable organizations disclose their major donors as a, as a condition of fundraising in the state. Charitable organizations in California that solicit contributions are required by state law to register with the state and provide reports that include their federal IRS Form 990. Now, while most Form 990 information is public, federal law requires that Schedule B, which lists an organization's substantial donors, be kept confidential. Americans for Prosperity and the Thomas More Law Center refuse to provide their Schedule Bs to the state and instead sue California. The risk of public disclosure of the sensitive document they argue violates the right of association, especially when California does not actually use it to investigate charitable misconduct. In a 1958 landmark decision titled NAACP v. Alabama, the Supreme Court unanimously held that requiring disclosure of a group's members may constitute as, an, as effective a restraint on freedom of, of association as other forms of government action. Not surprisingly, the NAACP joined an amicus brief defending the same principle in today's case. An important issue in the case was the legal standard that should be applied when in such compelled disclosure cases. The tougher the standard, the closer the connection must be between the government, between what the government wants to do and its reason for doing it. The, the, the district court applied a standard called exacting scrutiny, which requires that government action be substantially related to a sufficiently important governmental interest. Now this standard, according to the district court, further requires that the action must be nearly tailored for the government's purpose. This is a rigorous standard meant to minimize the possibility that government actions deter people from exercising their First Amendment freedom of association. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit reversed the, reversed the district after applying a more lenient version of this exacting scrutiny standard that did not require this nearly tenor connection or Taylor connection. The Supreme Court agreed with the district court that the state's actions must be narrowly tailored to the government's asserted interest. The Supreme Court found a dramatic mismatch rather than a close connection between California's dragnet for sensitive donor information and its claimed objective of preventing charitable fraud. California had not only previously failed to enforce its Schedule B disclosure requirement, but did not actually use that information when it investigated charities. Instead, the Supreme Court found that California's real reason for demanding this information was convenience. To simply have the information close at hand, just in case it might be useful. That was not nearly enough to justify the risk that the donor information might be disclosed. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, joined by Justices Stephen Breyer and Elena Kagan, wrote in dissent that the majority had actually abandoned rather than applied the court's precedents. She argued that under those previous decisions, reporting and disclosure requirements do not directly burden associational rights. Rather than the, the majority is up or holding that an upfront disclosure requirement automatically violated, the, automatically violated the First Amendment, that a centers would look at whether a particular plaintiff's freedom of association would actually or had actually been affected. The majority took note of the hundreds of organizations spanning the ideological spectrum that have filed briefs supporting the plaintiff groups in this case. They emphasized the gravity of the privacy concerns that any advocacy group would face from disclosure of donors. The deterrent effect feared by these organizations, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, is real and pervasive. The district court had provided or had cited evidence of pervasive Schedule B disclosures by the state 
as well as ample evidence that these particular organizations, their employees and supporters could face hostility, intimidation, or harassment upon the, such disclosure. California's assurances of, confine, of confidentiality, the Supreme Court said, were not worth much. Roberts concluded the court's opinion with this important admonition. When it comes to the freedom of association, the protections of the First Amendment are triggered not only by actual restrictions on an, on an individual's ability to join with others to further share goals, the risk of a chilling effect on association is enough. And that's a freedom that we all can share. Now, I definitely agree with what Roberts had said and and echo the Daily Signal's claim uh, claim that that what, what what Robert said is a freedom that we all can share. There's coming coming up the, this Sunday we will celebrate the Fourth of July, which is the nation's Independence Day. So as you celebrate it. Independence Day with your family, I ask that you do remember, remember what the Patriots did back in 1776 in writing the Declaration of Independence, which by the way was actually passed today, but they, but the first signature was on the, was on July 4th. I also ask that you bow your head in remembrance to all the, that the, the, that the founders had done in preserving this. Leave a comment down below what you think about what about the Supreme Court's decisions in this case or in the Benavich case as well as in the California case. I'll leave a link to the articles that, that I mentioned in the show notes down below, and I'll see you in the next video. And that's going to do it for the news for this week. I am Mick Bulo. Again, if you like what you watch, please go ahead and hit the thumbs up button. Also subscribe and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell an enemy or two even. And I will be back next week. Until next time. Peace.